Unfortunately, the vast majority of the population, at least among those who have been examined, have a magnesium deficiency. So today we'll talk about this mineral. Naturally, it is very closely connected with many other things. That's why the approach is always, of course, comprehensive. When talking about magnesium, I absolutely have to mention its crucial partner, calcium, because the ideal ratio between calcium and magnesium should be specifically two to one. And this is quite a delicate issue. Magnesium, in fact, actually ranks fourth in terms of its overall content within the human body. Fourth, after calcium, potassium, and sodium, of course. It is an intracellular element. This is a very important and crucial point because when it comes to the body's magnesium supply, for example, and if you use an analysis, such an analysis is often done using hair samples. You know, minerals in general can be thoroughly analyzed through hair. But in the case of minerals that are predominantly located inside the cells, this particular information is simply not sufficient. Unfortunately, this significant detail is not adequately noted in the existing literature. In this case, it is necessary to determine the magnesium content inside the cell. How do you determine it inside the cell? There is an approach where the erythrocyte is considered a model, a more or less adequate model of any cell. Of course, this is an approximation because erythrocytes do not have mitochondria, unlike other cells, but there simply is no better model. And of course, the only accessible cells are erythrocytes, as you clearly understand, among those that are available. So for erythrocytes, such technologies have been developed. Therefore, if you are interested in the issue of sufficiency, you need to, if a doctor asks you this question, and it is a serious question, keep this in mind. Consider whether it is possible to adequately determine magnesium, not just by hair or, say, blood plasma, but specifically in erythrocytes as a model cell, an accessible model. Of course, you might say that there are other cells in the blood, for example, white blood cells, but working with them is much more difficult. Their concentration is significantly lower. There are technical issues that arise there. 60% of magnesium is found in bone tissue. There, it is in a complex with calcium, and this issue needs to be discussed separately, that is, as a problem of bone tissue, because the standard approach always in regular lectures when talking about the skeletal system only mentions calcium, calcium phosphate. More precisely, it's not even regular phosphate, but so-called hydroxyapatite. But a very large amount of magnesium is also a significant part of this essential bone tissue component. 60% is quite a truly significant amount indeed. If it is necessary, magnesium can indeed be mobilized from the bone tissue itself. We usually talk about the mobilization of calcium, especially during menopause. But magnesium is also significantly mobilized, and it too can be readily lost through the body's excretory water systems. This process will also inevitably lead to the development or the worsening of an existing deficiency. And as for further potential problems, such as the excessive consumption of sweets or alcohol, we'll certainly talk about that as well. All these things are interconnected. You see how serious all of this is. The daily requirement for magnesium, that's what I mean. The daily requirement is about approximately 400 milligrams of magnesium for optimal health. 400 indeed. According to some sources, it can be 600. It varies. For men, for women, it's 100 milligrams less. Well, let's consider 400 milligrams as the average daily dose of magnesium. As for calcium, why am I talking about calcium? Because they work together as essential partners. There should ideally be twice as much calcium present. And this crucial ratio also needs to be carefully maintained. This is indeed a very serious issue. Naturally, the problem becomes even more acute for pregnant women. That is to say, the need significantly increases. And of course, it's also a very serious issue for nursing mothers and for dedicated athletes. We're talking about professional sports, which we will also discuss in a few more words. So what exactly are the primary sources of magnesium? Well, magnesium is an essential part of chlorophyll. Therefore, everything green is a significant source of magnesium. That's why they really say you need to eat more vegetables. From this point of view, yes, that's indeed true. But magnesium is found not only in green materials such as leaves and so on. 
although this is a very important source, especially considering the additional beneficial effects of, say, those very same vegetables, green ones first and foremost, you can clearly understand that their active and consistent use is absolutely relevant. But there are other sources, for example, bran. Bran is a very accessible product and is widely sold. 100 grams of bran contains more than the daily recommended dose of magnesium. Well, for example, no one is going to eat 100 grams of bran at once. But if you add wheat bran to every meal, morning, afternoon, and evening, you can easily get enough magnesium. Nuts also contain magnesium with amounts close to the daily requirement. So there are quite a lot of options available. You just need to pay very close attention to this. And besides that, there are also many different types of dietary supplements that contain magnesium. The form in which it comes is very important. This is a fundamentally important question. Naturally, any essential minerals, especially cations, meaning those positively charged ions that carry an electrical charge, basically metals, should always be used in a chelated form as organic complexes. There are a significant number of such beneficial complexes available for magnesium. For example, magnesium citrate, one of the most common and widely recognized forms, is essentially citric acid magnesium. Citric acid forms a stable chelate. Imagine that my fingers on the right and left are, say, a molecule of an amino acid. Here are two of them. And magnesium is located right here in the exact middle. This isn't just speculation. These are very serious X-ray data. This is what is called a chelate. But it's not just citrate that's known. Magnesium aspartate also exists and is very active. Magnesium threonate. Threonine is an amino acid. This product has only just appeared on the market. Magnesium lactate, that is to say, lactic acid magnesium. So, as you can clearly see, there are indeed many available options, and you can even choose precisely depending on which specific organ is affected by the possible magnesium deficiency. For example, muscle tissue is one thing, while the brain and nervous system are another. And based on that, you can select the appropriate chelated form of magnesium. That would be the smart approach. You just need to carefully avoid those particular products, meaning dietary supplements, of course, where magnesium is present as magnesium oxide or magnesium carbonate. As for magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt, this is what's known as magnesia, which is used very actively in cardiology, but in the form of intravenous administration. If you take such a product orally, it will act as a very strong saline laxative. In this case, water is actually drawn into the intestines, while magnesium is not absorbed. You need to be knowledgeable about this. So what should you choose? Well, most often, citrate is widely used, but that doesn't necessarily mean there aren't other effective approaches. As I have already mentioned, there are various chelated compounds available, and with a truly competent, in-depth approach focused specifically on the relevant organ, you can carefully select different forms of magnesium to achieve significantly higher effectiveness. I've given some specific and illustrative examples. For example, magnesium malate is a very active compound. That's magnesium combined with malic acid. Why is that the case? Because malic acid is an essential part of the so-called Krebs cycle, which is crucial for energy production. This is the energy powerhouse of any cell, except for red blood cells. and malate that is, malic acid, is a component of this cycle. And as for magnesium, without any doubt, you'll soon see where and how it plays a role. This kind of information expands the possibilities for using magnesium. Well, magnesium is excreted primarily through the kidneys and to some extent through sweat and the sweat glands. But for those individuals who go to bathhouses, especially saunas, that is dry saunas, the loss of magnesium through the skin through sweat can be quite significant. And if we're talking about athletes, for example, those who train and always use something like this after their workouts, then this problem arises and it's a serious issue. The absorption and subsequent assimilation of magnesium is often hindered by the excessive intake of certain substances, specifically calcium, phosphates, and sodium. This is precisely why you absolutely shouldn't salt your food, or at the very least, you should salt it extremely sparingly. And there are other reasons why you should limit your salt intake. Table salt is essentially sodium chloride. Naturally occurring fats will also interfere with the process. 
fats always interfere with the absorption of any minerals because they break down into fatty acids. And these fatty acids with their long tails form insoluble salts, including with magnesium, which disrupt its absorption. Increased sugar consumption is a very serious and significant issue and truly needs to be discussed separately. We consume sugar both in its pure form and in various hidden forms. This is something we shouldn't forget either. For example, in the form of delicious pastries and so on. Let's discuss this now from a biochemical perspective. And of course, alcohol. Alcohol, because it shares common and significant mechanisms with sugar metabolism. We're not talking about moderate or civilized consumption, but rather about excessive consumption, which, by the way, is quite typical for our country. This is a very serious matter indeed. Diuretics. We need to keep this in mind. All diuretics, especially synthetic ones, if prescribed by a doctor, also lead to the loss of minerals, magnesium, zinc, and others. And this needs to be taken into serious account. In my lectures, I always give the compelling example of a young businessman about 30 years of age who developed high blood pressure, well, constant stress. He was prescribed furosemide in order to significantly and volumetrically affect his overall blood pressure. But he ended up with a very serious loss of minerals. In his case, it was mainly about zinc, but this also applies to magnesium. Because when it comes to zinc, the symptoms are just very obvious. He also developed erectile dysfunction. And at the same time, there was a loss of magnesium. That's why you need to pay the utmost attention to these things. It's all very serious.